Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox, the instructor of the Big Data Applications and Analytics course at Indiana University. And this is Unit 2, Lesson 2. And remember, we this is in Section 1. We have lots of sections. Sections are divided into units. Units are divided into lessons. And this is the motivation. Unit, and we're going to now discuss the data deluge in general, starting with the 13 zettabytes we're going to find at the beginning of 2016, increasing some 40% year on year. But we will also discuss all other um, data in terms of various fields to show how universal the data deluge is. So this is the uh, KBCB. Um, Chart from which they you know they update this uh, every year. Um, they don't always put the same slides, but they have this type of um, slide every year. And then 2014 end of which is around here, we're up to nearly nine zettabytes. Beginning of 2016, 13, and <coughs> around 16 zettabytes towards the end of the year. All right. Notice that the largest science is around 100 petabytes, which is an amazingly small fraction, 0.4025 of the total. If we want to understand what a zettabyte is, what if we have 100 gigabytes on your laptop? Typical amount today may be of right order. That is 10 to the 10 laptops is a zettabyte. And remember, we have nine of them. An exabyte is a pretty big number. That is 1,000th of a zettabyte. A petabyte is also a pretty big number, and that's a one thousandth of an exabyte. And finally, we get down to um, terabytes. And remember, that's the size of disks, and um, you can buy uh, these uh, two terabyte disks for about uh, ninety dollars today. And terabytes are um, gigabytes, a thousand of gigabytes. And remember, hundred gigabytes is a typical piece of uh, laptop storage. Um, note that an interesting number about some interesting feature of seven zettabytes, it's about a terabyte per person. Pretty interesting, there's a terabyte per person on the internet today. So this explosion, huge numbers, is what's driving the data deluge, uh, data science, the fault paradigm, the cloud computing, and so on. Here's just some minor detail from a nice service, business intelligence. Um, <clears throat> this has the total cloud traffic in zettabytes per year. You know, it's sort of interesting. This is the natural unit. And uh, we have mobile clouds. This is, of course, pointing out the mobile cloud traffic is increasing more rapidly than the total. It's still a small part. Many people think that the not so far in the future, mobile will be the dominant use of all personal traffic. That's this thing I pointed out, that multi-core is making clients smaller. And therefore, only things like my poor old eyes are getting old and they don't like such terribly small screens. That's all that's keeping these personal devices small. Meanwhile, I'm gonna have uh, Smart washes and Google glasses and heart sensors and feet sensors and all what have you, all helping me and providing the uh, wearable me. So here we are, cloud traffic increasing significantly every year. This is standard Moore's law exponential. Here's this 1.8 billion photos per. Um, Day uploaded, and the remarkable thing is you can't see poor old Flickr, which is probably the best known of these various services. There's a tiny yellow sliver here you can see. Um, blue is dominant, Facebook, and then suddenly in 2013 up comes WhatsApp, and well, here comes Snapchat. With Instagram, which is part of Facebook, I believe, uh, hanging in there. So. Amazing number of um, photos uploaded every year, and as I mentioned, poor old K Kodak once you know was oh, was the dominant film supplier, 
and people took photos lovingly and they filled shoe, shoe boxes full of photos. And that was the unit of number of photos owned by a person. But now with the cloud as it is, you can fill many digital shoe boxes or virtual shoe boxes uh, and or electronic shoe boxes in the sky. Okay, here is a corresponding YouTube figure. Um, we have 20 hours six years ago. That's around here, 2009. <coughs> we have 100 hours around in 13, and actually 14 seems to be similar. I don't quite understand that, whether it's leveled off or this prediction here was a little inaccurate. But if you go to the you, this YouTube um, press release site, it still says 100. 100 hours of video uploaded per minute. It would be actually interesting if it leveled off. Because YouTube, although it has many comp competitors, is still a pretty uh, important um, dominant uh, service with many aspect, many people using YouTube, including this course, using YouTube uh, to deliver its uh, message. Here's an interesting uh, thing from from KBCB about music. So here we have streaming. Remember, this course is streaming. We have we don't have music. We have my harsh coughing voice, and here we have digital tracks, presumably sold online, but digital. And here we have physical music sales. So everything is declining except streaming music. People don't even want to store their music locally on their iPod or whatever they used to store it on. They just want to have their smartphone or phablet or tablet or maybe a window on their PC and just look at the mu listen to the music or look at the uh, digital uh, TV and um, web TV and that's it. That's presumably the future. And this is all part of digital disruption. The way of doing business is changing. We know there was a huge fight in the music business about this. And probably both sides won in the sense that the digital version actually dominated. And effectively won, although now you can see it's actually going down, but replaced by this. But in the end, uh, artists did get uh, some, get paid. Not everything is free, you have to go to uh, iTunes or Google Play and buy buy a lot of the things you want, but just some things offered free. This course is offered free, but I'm not a rock music star. Here's a first of a, some uh, slides about uh, sizes. So in every 60 seconds, this is actually still a little old, uh, but in every 60 seconds you have whatever it is, over 300 new Twitter accounts, 100,000 tweets. Uh, Tumblr, Tumblr is actually increasing a lot recently, so that's probably wrong. iPhone applications, um, Flickr, which we know is negligible. <coughs> 1,700 Firefoxes, uh, 700,000 searches, 1 168 million emails uh, sent every second, every minute rather, and uh, 60 blogs, and 70 new domains registered. And so on. These are just fascinating numbers here. The trouble is actually to keep up to date, to keep this slide, which is beautiful. I don't know any place that keeps these slides up to date. You just see them every now. They're produced in some uh, heroic effort and then they're not kept up to date. So that's life. Still, they're impressive. Here's another version focused on actually US government data. Here's U.S. Geological Survey, here is the global IP uh, um, traffic from Cisco. And it's sort of interesting, it's measured in 225 exabytes per month. It says per year you have zettabytes of uh, IP traffic. And that goes nicely with the zettabytes of data stored. Here's the Department of Energy. And here, remember, we have 15 petabytes of a year is, is some measure of the amount of data from the Large Hadron Collider. <coughs> Here is the global wearables. Remember, this is meant to be 25 to 50 billion 
by 2020, and we're according to this at the moment. Well, actually, see, these numbers are not consistent. Cisco has a larger number, but it, anyway, it's 2020, they make it as 20 billion. Um, so what do we have here? EOS DIS is the, um, that's a classic um, Earth science storage from satellites. Here we have the NIH explosion coming from gene sequencing. Um, we have, uh, that's here and here, this is NIH, this Cancer Institute. Uh, here we have uh, Internet of Things. So here's the Internet of Things. Oh, sorry, this is wearables, which is a subset of the Internet of Things. Obviously, Internet of Things lives in cars, lives in um, street, sign, street uh, monitors and so on, lives in homes. Uh, here we have uh, NOAA. Uh, the climate and weather of people, and here's that data increasing. And here we have DOD, and the drones pouring out data. What it says, 43 terabytes per data per drone. That's because cameras are digital, they take uh, their data and they get more, just Moore's Law says those uh, little CCDs get smaller every, every year and you get more pixels and therefore more data from your drone. Um, so this is a pretty interesting uh, um, graph from scalarity.com. So now we come to an analysis of a book called Taming the Big Data Tidal Wave, a variant of the data deluge, a tidal wave of data. And this is 2012 book, already old, sort of, from uh, a chief uh, analytics officer from Teradata, which is a major, major database company. And he covers the following uh, industry or business oriented applications. Web data, which he calls the original big data, where we know that uh, data from how people browse websites is actually used. Uh, gathered and used in all sorts of ways to motivate uh, mailings, to redesign those sites, to do recommender engines, to suggest from your browsing what else you might want to look at, and so on. Uh, auto insurance was discussed here. We can have sensors that monitor the driver, or actually more, less obtrusive, obtrusively uh, the cars and the the information about what the cars are suffering uh, from the bad driving can be automatically recorded and analyzed, maybe to set insurance rates. And maybe also to help drivers drive better. And also, of course, mend cars by identifying errors before they actually happen. Uh, there's a lot of forms of text data, of which email is the most uh, simplest example. Sentiment is analysis of tweets is text data. Here we have natural language processing. And also, there's an example which we do in the introduction from eBay, where they analyzed how people purchased lamps and were able to improve the interface from just looking at what people did and how, what they ended up doing so they could more quickly point you at what you wanted. Uh, one of the biggest, um, and actually, this is one of the 51 use cases. <coughs> Big data applications is uh, logistics or uh, analyzing truck fleets or um, delivery fleets or for its military and commercial and consumer applications where GPS data will can track uh, all these things, vehicles, trucks, people, and so on. That's GPS, we have RFID, which is sort of an auto tag, which uh, allows you to do better manufacturing logistics because you know where everything is. We have the smart grid, which is the electrical uh, utility industry. And uh, the smart grid can analyze local usage in a, in a building and tell that building how better to make use of, do what it's doing. And um, you can also monitor the actual power as it transfers to, through the network and then let make the network better used. There's the gaming industry, where you can look at RFID tracking chips, and that can help you identify fraud. 
We have just after this analysis from GE of industrial engines, which is sort of the industrial internet, and the sensor data and how that's an enormous amount of data can allow you a far more, a far um, more reliable uh, monitoring of large equipment. Video games is a little like the web data example, and even the auto insurance example, you have tele telemetri telemetry, which is monitoring what's going on in the case of users. And um, this is um, monitoring how people play games to um, um, to actually design better games and see what people like. And there's a whole broad social media example, which is um, the telecommunication industry and the Facebook and so on. And these the linkage of people to people allow you to find new customers automatically from a game, recommend their engine-like technology. Here we have the GE example I mentioned. So in 2012, who knows whether that's still accurate? Um, GE were gathering seven times the data of Twitter. And uh, so GE engines are a um, big data source. And that, that uh, data is used to uh, just monitor the health of the equipment. It's a general, a very nice example of the industrial internet. Which uh, there are several, um, you can find quite a lot of interesting um, discussions of that, because it's not just GE. GE has set up, in fact, a whole new uh, software endeavor in Silicon Valley because of the importance of the industrial internet. Here's a little more detail they have 25,000 engines, they have 3.6 million flight records per month. <coughs> And uh, each of them has 200 parameters, 18 million parameters per month. And uh, this allows uh, fuel efficiency, aircraft space capacity analysis, and produces all sorts of improvements uh, to the aircraft and the engines. And it uh, basically improves the whole maintenance process. Hopefully, will make customers happy because they identify uh, failures first. And this is a Pretty nice talk. I have a link down here from a talk at Berkeley, uh, uh, which is uh, I, I strongly recommend. So here um, is a su summary of uh, some sizes uh, from science and technology. We've already done the 15 petabytes per year for Large Hadron Collider. Radiology is big, 69 petabytes per year. There's a thing called the Square Kilometer Array Telescope, SKAA, um, which is uh, half a zettabyte per year of raw data in around 2022. 20, Usually these are a little optimistic. Earth observing is still quite small, only a few petabytes per year. Earthquake science is now a day actually terabytes more. Our polar grid is hundreds of terabytes per year and is growing very rapidly. This is due to the uh, improvement of the radars, which are just every time you improve your radar, add more channels, you get better resolution, you gather more data. An important application is just looking at the results of simulations. So you have these computers doing simulations. You can take a collection of simulations, a collection of results, analyze those results to get uh, much more insight. Actually, that's actually a pretty good example of machine learning. And that's around uh, a tenth of a zettabyte per year. Uh, from an excellent scale simulation. Here's a nice example from uh, NIH. And uh, this is a famous one. Here's the cost to sequence a genome. Here we have $100 million for the first genome in 2001, not so long ago. And now we have down here a little around $1,000 at the, at the budget. Genome sequencing organization. And what's striking is here's this cost to analyze the genome. And now we compare it with Moore's law. And so the cost to, to, to um, sequence a genome is drastically decreased by many orders of magnitude. Um, maybe uh, two or three orders of magnitude uh, is decreased by three orders of magnitude more than the cost of computing, which says then to analyze this data. For a given amount of, uh, for it's going to cost a thousand times as much. 
because uh, from what it did in 2001. So uh, something which was dominated by the effort of gathering the data might now be dominated by the actual processing, the actual analytics run on the data. And this is going to lead to uh, 100 petabytes or so per year if you, for instance, decided to sequence everybody. Here's an interesting um, curve highlighting an important issue which will come out at from several points of view. Here it's called the long tail of science. <coughs> And that says there are some fields like particle physics, that's the LHC, astronomy, the S square kilometer array, and LSST, and here's biology. And these are plotted about, um, these, are ha these have a few experiments, each of which is uh, very large, that's this up here. And, and then we have over here, we have the long tail, economics, social science, some biology, where you have individuals gather doing lo lots of experiments. But they've not got a lot of people involved and not a lot of data. So we have a few large data things, and then we have a lot of small data things. The lot of small data is the so called long tail. Long tail is very suitable to clouds because clouds are very effective at analyzing lots of things, each of which is not so big. They're not so effective at analyzing individually huge things because then you need to use parallel computing. And for some things like search and recommender engines, parallel, uh, clouds are very effective parallel computing engines. For other things like clustering, they're not so effective. Um, <coughs> so this is this type of graph is also seen when you look at books sold. There are a few books which sell an enormous amount, and lots of books which sell a small amount. And now if you run a physical bookstore, you sort of cut off here. Now you only have space to hold this. And the person going to the physical bookstore never sees this. This is why the internet allows, um, it's sort of more democratic, it allows the long tail to be accessed. And using recommender engines, you can actually suggest which part of the long tail people should look at. Pretty interesting. So here are some um, data intensive activities. Uh, from my point of view, I gave you the fellow, the, the Teradata fellow Francis view. Particle physics, which is a bag of events. Information retrieval is a bag of words. I'm trying to point out there's always a space attached to each of these activities. E-commerce, a bag of items to be sold or users trying to buy things. Social networking, a bag of people with links and properties. Health informatics, a bag of health records or a bag of gene sequences. Census. Lots of pixels, bag of pixels. And these applications here use statistics, deep learning, image analysis, recommender engines, or anomaly or outlier detection. And they do this on cloud. So this slide here really gives you a nice example of a rich set of fields and a different set of spaces with a range of tools all running on clouds and they're using variants of MapReduce. And this comes to our famous summary of the uh, course, the big data ecosystem in one sentence. We're using clouds, we're running data analytics, we're doing it collaboratively, all working together, we're processing big data, and we're solving problems in X informatics or EX. Uh, <coughs> and uh, EX informatics is a superset of X analytics, and here are the values of X we discovered on the web. And we noted there's some like physics, which weren't actually defined. We hadn't used the term informatics before, but should. And of course, we're doing data science. And uh, that's what this course is all about. And it's uh, an exciting new academic area, which captures all of this. And here is the final slide of this, uh, this lesson. Remember, this is lesson two of unit two. And this is from the web, what I collected, you know, these definitions where I found people had introduced the concept of X informatics before. Originally around when I first came to Indiana University, I taught my first class called X informatics and got attacked because people said it's, it's not a good idea. And then I stopped until um, I stopped for about 10 years and gave up that course. Oh well, I mean, you know, sometimes you have good ideas and you have them too early, or you give them up too early. You're too sensitive, and so on. Here we have earth science informatics, pathology informatics, 
lots of other <coughs> medical informatics here, health, health uh, informatics, biomedical informatics, medical informatics. Um, biochemistry, cheminformatics, biology, and so on, bioinformatics. Um, here we have uh, energy informatics, lifestyle informatics, which isn't quite the same lifestyle that, as I use it. Uh, but it's, at least there's a university in the Netherlands that uh, can study that. Environmental informatics, and a much bigger field, social informatics. All right, there we are. Informatics and ex-informatics. You can get rich, you can just cure cancer. Um, do whatever you want with ex-informatics. And all you have to do is learn a bunch of algorithms, buy a few clouds, and you're home. You have everything you need to do to do ex-informatics. And of course, you better get a degree in data science, because that's the qualifications. So here I am signing out of lesson two of unit two, the motivation. Thank you.